Well, good morning, Liberty. Welcome to Liberty Church. We're doing things a little bit different today, so uh, relax and enjoy. Uh, we're going to do some old hymns. We um, are going to celebrate Jesus. Uh, we learned at the end of 2 Corinthians that where we are weak, He is strong, and His grace is made perfect in that weakness. So today we're praying for His grace and His mercy in our weakness, and uh, we're praying that He show up in this service. So if you're watching online, we, we ask you just uh, find a way, a place of worship. If you know the songs that we're singing, um, sing along with us. If not, just um, relax and entertain and worship Jesus and, let it, and be open to His Spirit moving among your life. Uh, we're just going to warm up in a few songs, and then we're going to explore the book of Numbers in the way of announcements. Uh, our youth group started meeting again on Thursday night, had a pretty good crowd last Thursday night, so the, it was good to see teens gathering back and social distancing outside on our patio and, and uh, staying safe and connected. Uh, we have a new study coming up on uh, the 21st, I believe. Uh, we're going to work through a book called Secrets of the Secret Place, which is a book about how to really connect with Jesus in all aspects of your life, spiritually, uh, and immerse yourself in his spirit wherever you are in life. It's a book we used to use in intense discipleship here, and I think it'll really bless you. That'll be a Thursday Zoom group. Still have mops going on on Wednesday nights, if you want to tune into that. Uh, mothers of preschoolers, which is not just preschoolers, it's any mother that just needs some space to talk about parenting. It's a great place for you to connect and talk about parenting and how that works and how that fits. And Friday night on Stuck is Meeting, which are people struggling in addiction or habits or things that keep you stuck in life, uh, and the, they struggle together and work. There's no teachers there. There are people struggling together moving ahead. And right now in the middle of this pandemic, there's a lot of people that are stuck. They've, some of the things that used to stick us are coming back and sticking us again. So that's Friday night by Zoom as well. So tune into something, be a part of the church, and I believe you'll grow and I believe you'll connect. Let's pray and then we're going to worship. Dear Lord, we thank you for your presence today. We ask you to let your spirit move among us, be among us, and be in our lives today, Lord. Would you bless us as, our, as we attempt to worship you, as we attempt to come before your throne. Give us your spirit and your power, Lord. Lord, we pray for those that are watching this, that you uh, heal them, that you touch them, and they know your spirit today. Lord, we ask in your name, Jesus, that you're with us. In your name, amen. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt, no freedom from my sorrow I felt. But Jesus came and listened to me, and glory to God, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, he set me free. Now I am climbing higher each day. Darkness of night has drifted away. My feet are planted on higher ground. And glory to God, I'm homeward bound. He set me free, yes, he set me free. And he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, he set me free. Goodbye to sin and things that confound, naught of the world shall turn me around. Daily I'm working, I'm praying to, and glory to God, I'm going through. He set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, he set me free. He set me free, yes, he set me free, and he broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see, for glory to God, he set me free. Feel free. <laughs> I 
It's old school church. Old school might have known what they were doing, maybe. It's possible. Well, let's try this one out and see if we can feel something here. This is about being free, too. In Numbers, we're talking about being stuck in a place. They were stuck there for almost a year in one place, and uh, freedom is what we're after. So these songs are chosen to show us some freedom. So let's, let's sing a little about freedom. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. In this next song, if you need prayer, um, I'll pray after the song, but just would you bring it to Jesus? And uh, last week we looked at being stuck in the wilderness, the strange land, and uh, if we surrender it all to him, we'll move out of that land and move forward. But sometimes he waits till we surrender where we are. And sometimes the things we need to surrender are the craziest things. They're things that we'd like to get rid of, but yet we cling to them and that we know we should let go of and we cling to them. And we can't journey with Jesus till we let go of some of those things. And some of them are feelings and some of them are hurts and some of them are our guilt and some of them are things way back in our past buried there and some of them are things right now, but we really can't see the power of God and move forward until we surrender all to Jesus. So during this song, would you just bring whatever sickness, weakness, illness, thinking, heart, body, whatever it is, and would you surrender it to Jesus? And then we'll pray after this. If you want to post a prayer request, we'll try to pray after this for that prayer request. We'll, we'll take a moment and we'll pray for one another. And, uh, but I don't think prayer is effective until we surrender the things that we cling to. God can't fill our hands with the good 
till he let go of the things. Sometimes it's even good stuff that we're holding on to. He wants to fill us with better. And we can't really let him be Lord of our life till we surrender all, good, bad, ugly, all of it. So during this song, would you consider surrendering all you have to Jesus and uh, letting his power move in your life? All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit Truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, Lord I give myself to Thee, fill me with Thy love and power, let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Dear Lord, we come before you in prayer, and Lord, we ask that those who, who need you right now, those who need your presence and your power, those who need your strength, Lord, would you just uh, touch them now, Lord, as we surrender what we have to you, as we surrender our expectations for church, our expectations for this world, as we surrender the things that uh, we thought the world was made out of, and maybe some of the things we thought that trusting you was about, Lord. We ask you just uh, keep us in a place of surrender, Lord. Lord, as we explore this word of, of the book of Numbers, Lord, we ask just help us to move forward, Lord, in this place of surrender. Lord, I pray right now for whoever's watching this that has a physical problem, and uh, I believe there's someone watching that has a sickness that they feel can't be cured, Lord, but I believe you're waiting on a surrender. I believe you're waiting on us to, to surrender to you, Lord, and let your power be in our lives. And Lord, I believe there's someone watching this that uh, just their thinking just won't line up right now, Lord. Their thinking just keeps moving toward the negative, Lord. Would you just uh, 
Help them to surrender that thinking to you, Lord. Would you help us to be surrendered people, to believe that, that, that your, uh, your healing flows from our surrender. Your grace is found in our weaknesses and made perfect in our, our, our weaknesses and our, our failings, Lord, and, and that your strength is found as we, as we demonstrate our weakness, you demonstrate your power in us, Lord. So we surrender our strength. We surrender our methods. We surrender our way of doing things, Lord. And we ask for your strength, Lord. We ask for a display of your power, Lord. Let that be whoever's watching. Let them see you and know you, Lord. And let them, uh, let them follow you, Lord. Lord, we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we're in Numbers. And we're going to start in Numbers chapter 7. Last week we looked at the first six chapters of Numbers. Remember in this book of Numbers, Israel is camped at Sinai. They've been camped at the foot of Sinai now for a, a year or so. And um, there's a promise, and they, they've done a census, they've counted, that the promise that Abraham's children will be as many as the stars, there's a lot to count. However you use the numbers that we looked at last week, there's a lot of people there. They're free people. They've been set free from slavery. But... Now what? And sometimes as a Christian, you've been set free from your past, and you stand in God's presence. Um, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer a slave to pa the past, but now what? And sometimes you reach a place where you start saying, Lord, what is the next place? What is the next level? What is your promise in my life? Because the promise wasn't complete in, in the book of Numbers, because they were promised the land, the land that Abraham inhabited, which they're a long ways from that land at this moment, and that land is occupied by a hostile enemy that's not going to just say, here, take the land. So there's an impossibility standing in front of them. But right now they're camped at Sinai, and they've been there dwelling in God's presence. And there is a place in your life where it's just great to dwell in God's presence. The first six months of this coronavirus pandemic, I've really dwelled in God's presence. I've gardened and worked on how on my house and taken time and reflected on God and recentered myself and I feel like I've dwelt in the foot of Sinai for the last six months but now and I feel like a lot of us have here in this church and maybe you have if you're watching this but the truth is we need to move on toward a promise the promise for this church was that we would reach 10,000 people and that we would do that across a 50 mile radius from the center of where we are right now we've heard that promise over and over for 20 years and right now in the middle of this pandemic, it looks a long way off. It looks as far away from us as the promised land did for the children of Israel camped at Sinai. So how do we get there? And when we look at your life individually, are you living all of the promise of God yet in your life? Or are you just living part? Are you only choosing parts of it and not allowing the full promise of God to be in your life? I wonder what... Uh, as the old hymn said, peace we forfeit when we don't take that to God. I wonder what things that aren't in our life when we're trying to camp at Sinai when God is saying it's time to move on. So what is our next level as a church? And, you know, if coronavirus has done anything for us as a church, it's reset a lot of what we did and a lot of what we did before maybe we won't do again. And a lot of things that we need to do are in front of us ready to be done. And and I think it does reset what it is to be the people of God. A year ago, I would have panicked over the tech glitches if you were watching last week. We dropped audio, we dropped this and dropped that. And, and this week, I would have panicked when I didn't have a worship team behind me. But you know, I'm, I'm open to whatever God wants to do now. I'm open to God doing something that is uh, um, different. And, and I think stirring up things, and I'm open to that difference. And hopefully you are too. So What's the next level for us as a church? Well, I don't know. I feel like we're at Sinai waiting on God to say, there's the next level. So this sermon is on numerous levels. It's talking about you and how you move out into the promise of God. It's talking about us as a people, as a church, how we move out into the promise of God. And it's talking about the church in America or in this world. How do we move out into the promise of God? Because I believe in 2,000 years, the, the world has yet to see what the church could actually do if it trusted God and allowed Him to be their God and quit worrying about the things of the earth. I think the, earth, the world has yet to see that church, and I would love to see that church. So last week was pretty practical about the children of Israel lining themselves up for the promise. Uh, we looked at things like they needed to be a grateful community, they need to be a holy community, they need to be a community of restoration where they restored wrongs and built up wrongs. We, 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 they need to be a community that left a lot of things up to God 
some of the judgment, some of the trying to figure out who's wrong and who's right, some of that we need to leave up to God. We, we learned that last week that there are sometimes times when we're called to set aside ourselves for God. The Nazarite vow in chapter 6, there are times we set ourselves apart, and hopefully you've considered doing that. If you're still stuck after last week's sermon, it may well be because you're not setting aside your life for God. You may still not be, and, and you don't have to let your hair grow long and do the things of the Nazarite. I do think it's cultural. I think they're, uh, the Nazarite essentially separated his or herself from the things that were common in this world, and, and we call that fasting in our world. Uh, they, they allowed God to be their visible strength, and they separated them from anything that brought death. And I urged you last week to separate yourself from whatever's bringing death. Could be how, what your television set's tuned to. Could be how your radio stations are tuned. Could be some of the people you hang around. And if you aren't in tune with what's life and what's death, you really do need to get to an altar and ask Jesus to demonstrate life so that you can feel death when you know it. The world is sliding toward death and doesn't know it. We're awake to that. So separate yourself from the things that bring about death. And finally, we ended in the great priestly blessing, which is the Lord bless and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And we unpacked that and said we're a blessing community. We want to be a, pr a community of great blessing. We want to be a community where being a part of Jesus brings about a great blessing in our life and, and, and that we understand what real peace is. We want to see the face of God smile upon us. We want to when we come together for worship, we want to see the face of God smile upon us and to, and to know His love for us. This week, it's a little more focused. It's the same basic theme we could have continued right off from last week, but it's still Israel preparing to depart, to move forward. It's still Israel sitting at the foot of this mountain. But the theme shifts a little bit more towards their worship life, their prayer life, their direct connection to God, a little more toward their devotional life. So, so today I want to look at going to the next level, receiving the promise, and I want to look at it from the viewpoint of, this, of worship in Israel as we look at these next couple chapters. Now, now, if you're reading this carefully along with me, you'll notice it shifts a little here. It does actually shift here because the best that we can figure, uh, chapter 7 actually happened about a month before chapter 1. The census was the last thing to happen, but the writer of Numbers chose to draw us back to the idea of worship. Remember I told you, literary-wise, the purpose of these first ten chapters is to build the tension so that you're screaming out as you read this, when are they going to leave Sinai? When are we going to move out? When are we going to begin this advance? And you're thinking, how many lists are there going to be before we begin moving? When are we going to move forward? And I think it mirrors our life when we often sit and cry out, Lord, when are you going to move me out of this place I'm in? When are you going to advance? And when are you going to move this church out of the rut that it's in and into the road that you've, you've chosen for us? And, and it, sometimes it feels very much like reading the first ten chapters of Numbers, thinking, well, another list. Another this, another that. So I think they moved the worship section here because it delays the tension. You're thinking, oh good, we've reached the blessing. Surely we're going to move and then we're back to another section. But I think it's also there at the end because the final position emphasizes that what's really important is worship. Their focus as they move forward is the most critical thing. If they advance without the right worship focus, disaster will fall. And by the way, don't want to spoil the book of Numbers for you, disaster does befall them because they didn't listen to these, these next couple of chapters. They didn't maintain the focus of worship that they should have had. So chapter 7. Chapter 7 tells us that if I'm going to be a next-level Christian, if we're going to be a next-level church, we've got to be a part of a giving community. There are two kinds of people in the world, givers and takers. You can't be one, or the, you can't be one and be the other at the same time. Givers are never takers. Givers never steal. I mean, somebody who would give you stuff is never going to steal from you. Takers always take. They never give anything. And there are really two kinds of people. When you come to the church, you have a choice. Did I come to take from the pastor and take from the church and, and as we used to say, get my soul filled up on Sunday morning? No, I don't, think you, I don't think that's why we come to church. I think we come to church to give. I think we come to church to overflow into others' lives. I think we come to church to bless others. We come to be a priest and afford Aaron's priestly blessing over the church. We don't come to make God's face shine upon me. We come so that God's face can shine on you all. 
We come so that God can be gracious to you through my weakness, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians. We come so God lifts his countenance up on you all, not on me. We come so that God will give you peace. And maybe I have war, but I come so that God will give you peace. And I think that's what Jesus meant when he said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added to you. If I come looking to bless you, he'll take care of me. But if I come looking to be taken care of myself, I'm always going to say that church falls short. I'm always going to say this place falls short. Being critical of leadership or of the church itself is really just a sign that you're a taker, not a giver. And that's going to be real important when we finish next week's sermon. That'll be a very important point to, to put in your notes. Because the simple truth is, if we came for what we could get, we're going to be disappointed no matter where we are. If we came where we could give, well, then we'd be just thrilled with a little podunk church in a cow pasture like this because there's a lot of places to give here. There's a lot of things I could do here, and I would be excited about giving. And so they begin giving, and chapter 7 is about giving. If we're going to give, if we're going to move forward, you've got to give toward that movement. You've got to give toward the promise. If, if there's a promise in your life, you've got to let go of the things that keep you out of that promise. You've got to give toward the movement. If the church is going to move forward, you have to give toward that advance before it advances. If we're going to build a building, you're going to have to give before we build a building. If, if we're going to go back and meet in schools, you've got to give to buy the equipment to go meet before we go do that. If we're going to reach 10,000 people and 50 miles all around, We've got to give to that idea before that idea comes to pass. And that's the principle of the beginning of chapter 7. They gave. Now, what did they give? It says the chiefs of Israel came and, they, and, and the heads of the father's house. And here's what they brought in verse 3 of chapter 7. They brought their offering before the Lord, six wagons and 12 oxen. You get what they gave there? We're stuck at Sinai. We ain't going nowhere. But they somewhere around Sinai, for the last 11 months while they were camped there, all of the tribes were hiding over behind a tent, nailing together some wood, and building an ox yoke, and building a staff to pull with, and building wheels, and putting a deck on it. They was building an ark. They was building a cart to move forward on. They were building it. So all the time they were stuck, they were building the vessel that moved them forward. All the time. And then they took that vessel, and they gave it to the priest, and in giving to the priest, because the priests have to move the tabernacle, nowhere did God say how they were going to move the tabernacle as far as carts. It called for a cart, but it didn't say they had the cart. They actually give what it takes to move forward. They give the very thing that it takes to move forward. Now it's given to Gershon and Merari, two of the sons of Levi, and not given to Kohath, it says. Why? Because Kohath had to carry the high holy ware, the, the, the table, the Ark of the Covenant, the incense, the, the, the altar, they carry, none of that was to go on a cart. It was to be carried in the book of Numbers. So they carried it. The wagons were distributed. So you understand what's happening there. That They gave toward the movement. They gave, they, you know, giving does several things for us. Giving brings us near to the heart of God. It says in verse 3, they brought their offerings before God. They brought their offering toward God. Giving brings us next to the heart of God. Doesn't John 3.16 tell us that God so loved the world that he gave? You're nowhere more like God than when you're a giver, when you're giving toward the future of what God has planned for us. Uh, giving also, the part always represents the whole. The leaders brought wagons to the Levites. The leaders represented all the people that were with them. The wagons represented all their desire to move. And the Levites represented the priests who were to all people. Remember last week we saw how they represented the firstborn. Giving is always a representation of the whole. Uh, Jesus, I think the song we sang, I Surrender All, I think he requires us to, in theory, give all we have. It's all his anyhow, and he's going to take it all back. One day you're going to die, and you're not going to take it with you. It all belongs to him anyhow. So the first thing in giving is to know that it does belong to him. Surely these families could have thought, you, you know, they had stuff to haul too. They had tents. They had possessions. They had things. Surely somebody in these families thought, that's a nice wagon. You know, we could use that wagon ourselves. Why don't we keep the wagon? Why don't we, I mean, maybe, maybe you're a better giver than me, but often when I'm called to give something large, a uh, roofing project we're in or some uh, to missions in a large way, uh, it still goes through my head, well, I could nearly buy a car with this. I could, I could fix my car with this. I could, uh, God calls us to give and give even though it costs us because the part represents the whole, and that's the whole principle of tithing. If you want 
the whole 100% of what you have blessed by God, you're going to have to give the 10% because the 10% represents the 90%. The 10% stands in place of the 90%. They understand that in this concept. So if we're going to move forward, we've got to be a community that gets what it takes to be givers. And it's not just money. It's giving of our time, talent, and treasure. It, the time I use to bless God and worship Him in this Sunday morning as we come together and worship represents the whole of my week. That's why we do it at the beginning of the week. That's why Sunday morning is the beginning. One of the trends I'm noticing online, and if you're watching this on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, don't feel guilty, but one of the trends I'm noticing is that our viewership live has went way down, but our viewership during the week has gone up, and people tell me that they're watching later in the week. This is not just a watching, okay? This is not, this is not a TV preacher. This is not just a watching. This is a church, and and I, to me, feel like it's worth the effort. Now, if you work Sunday morning, that's different. But it, the, the truth is, I think it's worth the effort to make the first part of your week, Sunday morning, the best part for God. I think it's worth setting it apart for God because the part represents the whole. And honestly, when do you want the whole to be blessed? Do you want the whole to be blessed halfway through? Or do you want the whole week to be blessed at the beginning of the week? And that's the same with your money. Do you want your money blessed halfway after you spent it? Or do you want your money blessed the moment you get it? I'll take the blessing as early as I can get it. The part has to represent the whole. And, and another principle of giving is that giving provides the means of ministry. That's what it does here. Giving provides the means that the Levites could carry this, these goods. We'll also learn as the rest of the chapter goes on. I'm not going to read the rest of the chapter unless somebody wants to read. Anybody vote we read this? If you've got your Bible open, you get what I'm saying. It is 80, how many verses long is this chapter? Um, 80, 89 verses long. And it does, and I've went through it with a fine-tooth comb. Every single list is exactly the same. as There's no variation. It's the same list. It lists the leader of a tribe, and it lists what they brought in offering and a sacrifice. The list doesn't repeat, but it does tell us a few things. It tells us that every gift is important. It doesn't say that there's a summation statement at the end of the chapter. It doesn't just sum it up. What every person brought was important. And I think that's an important principle for us to know. When you came to church this morning, if you brought a message in tongues, if you brought a word of prophecy, if you brought a financial offering, if you brought a, 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 an offering of blessing other people, an encouraging word for somebody, if you came prepared to give, what each of us gives is just as important as the next person. None of them are left out here. So I think the list is important for us to get. We're not going to read it all uh, because you'd go to sleep while we were reading it all. But it is very important to get that every name was worth recording. Uh, real quickly, I mean, uh, Nashon from Judah, the, the tribe that had moved to preeminence, we looked at that last week. They weren't the firstborn, but they had moved there because God chooses where people fit. That's going to be really important, by the way, as we move on to Numbers. That's another principle you want to write in the first page of Numbers. God chooses who's where uh, to put people where he wants them to be, and we have to accept his choice. That's a very important principle. Judah's there. And it says he brought a silver plate whose weight was 130 shekels. Uh, a shekel, by the way, uh, is, is um, about a quarter or a third. Uh, it's about four-tenths of an ounce is what a shekel, shekel works out to. So he brought a golden dish of 10 shekels uh, full of incense. I'm sorry, I've skipped a little. A silver plate was 130 shekels. Silver basin of 70 shekels. And in that basin was the flour and the oil and for the grain offering, a golden dish of 10 shekels, which a lot of Bibles say is a spoon. It meant a, a, a little scoop, uh, full of incense that had incense for the altar. See, they're actually bringing golden and silver vessels of very high price, but they're full of the things the priests need to minister with. They're full of the incense. They're full of the animals needed for sacrifice. They're full of the flour and the things that the ministers needed to minister with. One bull from the herd, a ram, a lamb a year old for the burnt offering, a male goat for a sin offering. For the sacrifice of peace offering, two oxen, five ram, five male goats, five male lambs a year old. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amminadab. So, so basically the silver plate, if you're taking notes, was about three pounds. Uh, the silver basin was about one and three quarter pounds. And the spoon full of incense was about four ounces. So it was a lot of wealth. It was a lot of stuff, and each tribe brings their offering. The point we need to gain here is simply this, that every person brought an offering, and every offering was equally valued. Even They are literally the same thing. 
And I think it tells us that as we minister to one another in the church in gifts, whatever you bring for your gift, whatever you bring on Sunday morning as a gift, a word of prophecy, a song, or whatever you bring as a gift, it's just as important as what anybody else brings. If a millionaire walks in and puts a check for a million dollars in the box, and a little old lady wants to sing a song glorifying Jesus in a scratchy voice that's off-key, the simple truth is they're both an offering equally valuable to God. Because God, million dollars doesn't impress God. It doesn't. Whatever we bring. But what is important is we had the attitude of being a bringer, a giver, a person who does give, not a person who receives. If we have that attitude, whatever we give is acceptable to God. But if we, as Paul saw in 2 Corinthians, give reluctantly, we shouldn't be giving. If it's, a, if it's something where we feel like we're under an obligation to give and we feel guilt about it, we should probably come to Jesus and let him refine our souls a little bit. Notice what happened in the end in verse 89. Uh, it says, And when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speak to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony and from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. You know what giving does? Some of you say, well, I've never really heard the voice of God. Maybe you're not a giver. And I don't just mean money. I mean, in maybe your attitude, maybe you need to fall on your knees and say, God, shift my heart to one of giving. Because, you know, if I came to church this morning and my attitude was I'm going to give, this place can be better than it was when I got here. I'm going to give. I'm going to bless somebody. I'm going to give an encouraging word. I hope I have a message in tongues. I hope I have a word of prophecy. I'm going to write a check. I'm going to give while I'm here today. And this church will be better when I leave than when I got here. Do you think you're not going to hear the voice of God about how to give? Do you think you're not going to hear God say, hey, go give an encouraging word to that person or go do this or go do that? Or why don't you clean this? Or why don't you do that? Well, you have a giving heart, you're going to hear the voice of God. If you don't have a giving heart, if you came today saying, well, I wonder what old Pastor West is going to say. Probably won't bless me. I don't know what the music will be like today. Probably be lame. I don't know. I, this church needs a lot of work. I'll just sit back here and judge it. That's what I'll do. You know what you're going to hear from God? Nothing. The only thing you're likely to hear from God is, why don't you get on your knees and get your attitude right? If you're going to be a church that moves forward, if this will be a church that moves forward from toward the promised land, we're going to have to shift our heart to being people that give, not people who take. Next thing I want to look at in chapter 8, we're going to have to be a community of light. This is a real short part of it, but it's something that's very important because it focuses on something that uh, a lot of this draws from other pieces. And back in Leviticus, we saw how that Aaron was to aim and move the lights on this, uh, on this candlestick that's in the Holy of Holies. If you remember, you had the tent, you had the outer tent, you had the inner tent, and then you had the Holy of Holy place. And in that inner tent, which was roughly a, a rectangle shape, was a candlestick with seven lights on it, and these were seven flames that rose up out of it. And the candlestick was stylized roughly after the tree of life. It had leaves and petals on it, and it was about life. It was about the light and life of God, and it illuminated. It had reflectors on it, and it cast a very bright light straight across from it. Now, if you remember the layout of that from Leviticus, straight across from it was the table of showbread, where 12 loaves of bread were placed daily that represented the fellowship of God's people. So literally what it tells us is that the, the importance of chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 8 was Aaron is to set up the lamps of the seven lamps to give the light in front of the lampstand. And if you don't read that carefully, you don't get what it's saying. But in verse 2 it says every day Aaron was to take those lamps and aim those so that that light shone directly upon the fellowship that's represented on the table of fellowship. You know, it really is a picture of what we try to do in church on Sunday morning. It really is a picture of my job here in the church. My job is to take this light of God's Word and to try to aim this at your heart. Now, I had somebody leave here about a year ago, told me my sermons were too hard. They made them think too much. Man, they wanted to go somewhere where they didn't have to think so much. And I actually took it as quite a compliment. I hated the person left, but the simple truth is the job of this word and my job is to take this word and try to aim it at your heart so that it shines the light of God into the dark places of your heart. And that's what a lot of people are afraid of. Some of us like the darkness. It says in, in, in John that the, light didn't, the darkness didn't understand the light because it couldn't comprehend it. Paul gives us the same basic metaphor that light and darkness can't mix. The simple truth is every day Aaron was to take that light and shine it into the fellowship of God's people. 
to take that light and shine it upon that table of showbread, which was a golden table fringed in gold. It would have been quite bright and quite lively. It would have lit up every part of that table so that that table was a place of God's abundance and blessing in the fellowship of God. So in verse 2, he takes those lamps and he aims those lamps. He moves them toward it, this thing that represents the tree of life. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the eyes of God moved around the earth like a flame of fire looking into the earth. Now to the Hebrew mind, God had seven eyes, which don't try to draw the picture. I mean, it's stylistic. It meant God had complete seeing. Seven is the number of completion. But that was seen as seven fires, seven flames of God. So this candlestick was seen literally as the eye of God looking into the people of Israel, the all-seeing eye, the seven eyes of God who could see everything in the fellowship. And we don't hide anything from God. The point of this is when we come, if you really want to advance forward in God, you're going to have to want to be a part of a community of light where our sin can be seen. I don't want a church where my sin can be hidden. Some people tell me, I want to go to a great big church where nobody looks at me, nobody knows I'm there, and I I want to go to a church where people know me. And you can do that in a big church. You can have fellowship in small groups. I want to go to a church where people know me. It's one of the dangers I think we have with coronavirus. I think after six months of setback, okay, we've done this. We've done it out of necessity. You're watching out of necessity. But there is a point where I think we have to get ourselves back into the light of one another to where we can be seen. Well, that church looks into my soul. That's what it's supposed to do. That that sermon cut right down into my soul. Yeah, it's supposed to do that. That's that's exactly, it's supposed to be light shining out in the darkness. And if you're afraid of that light, maybe you don't quite understand Jesus yet. Maybe maybe you need Jesus. So so what we want to seek is light, not darkness. We want to seek that light and and call out that light. And, and, And it is like a sermon. It's arranged to fall on the fellowship like that bread. It arises from the center of the camp, notice, not outside. And that's an important distinction. This candlestick was at the center of the camp. Last week we saw how it was arranged. It's not coming from the outside. The voice of God does not come from the outside. I've had people, I mean, I still get people all the time. Pastor, I have a prophetic word for your church I'd like to come deliver. I don't want your prophetic word. I don't need a prophetic word from out there about how we do business here. Because I believe the voice of God rises from the center of the camp. I believe the prophets rise here, and I think the greatest prophet for this church are the people that are in the church, not some person from outside speaking some canned piece of prophecy. I believe the greatest word of God rises from the center of this church. I believe the gifts rise from the center, not from the outside. I believe 1 Corinthians teaches us that we're fully equipped for whatever we need to do as a church may not look like it right now. We're really thin. Coronavirus has taken its toll. It may not look like it, but I believe everything we need to move out of this camp and into the next camp, I believe everything arises from the center, and I believe it's already here. It's just not being used. I, I believe that, that light should shine for all of us, and that light rises up from the center of this church, from those you give a word of prophecy, from those you give a message in tongues or an interpretation, for those who give an encouraging word, for those who are willing and, and, and able to accept the call to teach God's Word, to, to lead one another as elders and as leaders in this church, for those of you who take the platform and worship with our normal worship team, which you didn't see today, but, but, but you're taking on yourself the idea of shining the light of who God is on people's life, and that's a very important piece in moving forward. If we're not people of light... Think about going on a journey. I mean, if it's nighttime, which it is night in this world, maybe you haven't noticed it's a dark world, but if it's night and you get called outside for a strange noise, what's the first thing you grab? Don't say your pistol. I know you live in Bealton, okay? (laughs) You're going to grab a flashlight first, even before you get a pistol, because a pistol's useless without a flashlight. You don't want to shoot your neighbors. I mean, uh, so a flashlight's the most important thing you'll grab. And if you want to move forward out of the house and into your yard, you get a flashlight. When we take our dogs out at night, first thing we do is turn the big lights on on the back of the house, right? You don't go out and stumble around. If you want to move out, you're going to need a light. At nighttime, the first thing you do when you get in your car and start it is turn on the headlights, right? Because you drive down the road without headlights, you ain't going to be driving very long. Stay in the light of God. Stay in the Word of God. Stay in the light that exposes the... Don't be afraid of that darkness. The light that shines on it will also bring forgiveness. Next part of chapter 8 tells us we want to move forward 
we're going to have to change our identity to the identity of being priests in a holy community. We looked a little at this last week. Priests, remember, protect the margins of the camp. A priest protects the margins. They've camped round about the holy place and they kept people from just walking in, gawking around, pretending like they belong there. That they realize that there are levels of holiness, there are levels of how God works in our life, and that there are holier places than others, and they protect those margins around the holy. Literally, there are holy people. There are people who've given their life to Jesus. A true priest, if somebody comes to this altar and accepts Jesus, will dedicate their life to protecting that new margin in that person's life. But we also learn to mediate the margins. The margins aren't so large that nobody can get in. We don't build a wall around our faith. We create doors through walls that already exist so people can enter into our faith with us. We mediate that margin. We don't let the wrong thing happen in that margin, but we try to keep it so that new people can come find Jesus any day. You know, maybe it seems unfair to you that somebody can walk through that door over there and accept Jesus and have the same standing before God as you do. But the truth is forgiveness is very unfair. You ought to pay the price too. You ought to have had to suffer too, but forgiveness, because Jesus suffered and died for us, forgiveness is terribly unfair, but it's not you that's being slighted. It's Jesus that's, being, that's had the unfairness done to him. He chose to have it done to him. Simple truth is we mediate that. We allow people to come and find Jesus. We want to be a church where people can come and find Jesus, even if there's a lot of dirt in your life. And we've seen that. You all are good at this. You've done this for 20 years now. We've seen drug addicts, and we've seen people with life-controlling issues. We've seen people with mental illness come in and find help. We've, we've loved them, and we've mediated that. And we've, even though they wanted to bring the world in with them often, we've managed to mediate that and protect that. Last thing a priest does is they represent God to the world. If you're going to be a Christ follower, you're taking the name Christ. You're taking the name Christian you are claiming to be an anointed one. That's what Christ means, an anointed one. You are a little anointed one, and you walk in this world with that name of Christ on you. You represent Christ to the world, so you don't belong to you. You don't have the right to fly the bird at people. You don't have the right to spout off obscenities at people. You don't have the right to run around and knock people in the head. You don't have the right to, cheal and, to steal and cheat and destroy people. You, you, you represent God to the world, and you have to represent His love, and this is our calling. And the important thing is here that Israel, if they're going to move forward, needs that identity so entrenched in them that when they get in this strange world... See, right now, a camp next to Sinai, it's real easy to protect the margins. It's just them in the desert. And it's real easy to mediate the margins. There's nobody trying to come in and out. It's, 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 there's not a lot of margin there. And representing God to the world, well, they're not in the world yet. But very soon as they inherit the promise, they're going to be in a hostile land with people who don't believe in the same God. And they're going to have to protect the margins. And they're going to have to learn to mediate the margins with people like Rahab, who was a foreigner who managed to come into the margins. They're going to have to represent God to that world, whether that means a sword or whether that means love. They're going to have to represent God to the world. You're a priest. You're called to be a priest. One of my favorite scriptures in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, uh, is to him who, has, who loves us and has freed us from our sin by his blood and made us to be a kingdom of priests to God his Father. You're a kingdom of priests. And one of our identities as a church, or you as a Christ follower, is you're a priest. We don't have a priest here who wears a collar. I mean, I can wear a collar legally, but, and I wear priest's robes for some of our liturgical service, but the simple truth is, I believe we're all priests. I may represent you as the pastor of the church, but we're all pastors. We all encourage and build others. We're all priests. Remember the part representing the whole? I represent you. But the truth is, you're as much a priest as I am. We're all priests in the sense that it's your job to protect the margins, to help people across the margin and to represent God to the world. You are a kingdom of priests. And that identity is very important if we're going to move forward. We are, in verse 19, uh, we are intercessors. No, notice what it says in verse 19. For, first of all, in verse 16, it says, they are wholly given to me. In verse 16, the Levites are wholly given to me. But in verse 19, it says, All I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his son from among the people of Israel to do the service of the people of Israel. There's a lot to unpack there. But the simple truth is the Levites were given to God, but now God says he's the one who gave the Levites to the people. The Levites gave themselves to God, but now God's the one who gives them back to the people. 
And that's the attitude we want as priests in God's kingdom. We want to give ourselves to God, but then we want to be given back to the people of God. And the truth is, I want to come to church and I want people to say, Wes is a gift to this church, a gift from God. How about you? Wouldn't you like that to be what's said about you when you come to this church? There's a gift. Well, I'm glad that person's here. You know, there have been plenty of people over our history that weren't a gift. And so you could say amen. When they came, you're thinking, I don't know when they're going to leave, but they need to find a good thing there are other churches nearby because this person's a... Uh, you know what I mean? Some people just, they, they come and they suck the soul out of everybody. They lead people astray. We looked at this in 2 Corinthians. It's amazing how much this lines up with 2 Corinthians. But these Levites, they gave themselves fully to God. Therefore, God gave them fully back to the church, to the people. They were a gift to, to the people of God. And why? Because they were given, it says, to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting. Their job was to serve. Their job was to take care of people, to serve. It's their purpose. And to make atonement for the people of Israel, to stand in their place. You remember the part about the part representing the whole? If, if we'll be willing to be people who stand and intercede for others, I think we can make atonement for them. You have lost loved ones. We have a lost world. We have a lost system of government, it looks like, anymore. We have a lost, there's a lot of loss in this world. And at some point, we stand up and say, we, we're going to make atonement for that. We're going to try to, we're going to, try to bring healing into that. We're going we're gonna to be atoned so that we can be a gift of atonement. Atonement simply means at one to make one with God. I'm atoned or one with God, and I try to bring the world into oneness with God. And my goal then is to bring our system of government not into the way I like it or what benefits me, but to bring it into a place where it can represent that God is the ultimate one in charge. To bring us to a place where the culture is atoned before God, that's what a priest does. They represent God to the people. And get this, this is very important, that there may be no plague among the people of Israel when the people of Israel near, come near the sanctuary. I've had some nasty grams from a few people um, that have said that um, I'm suggesting that the coronavirus is something that God has done, a plague that God has done trying to reform and move America forward. And uh, I don't apologize for that. I believe that's what it is. And the devil may be bringing it. Is God bringing it? Is the devil bringing it? Do we bring it on ourselves? I've said a hundred different sermons. There's no point in even contemplating that question. Read the book of Job if you don't doesn't matter where it came from God's going to use it and God wants to use this to do what he wants to use this to reform the church in this land this world this whole place uh, I, I've sensed this coming last year we had words of prophecy about this coming last year God is shaking up everything and he's doing it so that the world becomes at one with him and as soon as we get that idea I think we don't have to worry about the plague anymore I think that plague is lifted and I think if we become agents of atonement, I mean, it's nice we wear masks, and we do. We wear masks here in this church. If you're, if you're watching online, you can't see it, but there's a line here. If you're past that line, you must wear a mask. Back here we don't because it's impossible to sing with it on. It, uh, uh, but, but, but we do try to monitor one another that are past this bubble, and we don't have prayer up here. I mean, that's all good sense to me. But we do all this work shutting down an economy, shutting down a world, movie industry going, airline industry going. We do all this work. And the reality, the best way you can prevent a plague among yourself is to be an agent that makes atonement for people. That's what it says right here. Be a priest that makes atonement for people. Make yourself useful. Be the kind of person wherever you are, people are made at one with God. Think about that. Is that your life? Wherever you go, do people say, boy, I feel closer to God now. Hey, I talked to this person, now I feel more closer to God. I was anxious, now I feel calmer. I, was, I feel like I'm growing closer to God. You become that agent in the world, it says there is no plague among those people. There is no plague that falls among those. I'm not saying I won't get sick and die of coronavirus myself. I'm not saying that at all. I don't care. I'm ready to go to heaven. It doesn't matter to me. But the simple truth is the job of the church is to not run around and fight coronavirus. Our job is to make atonement. Our job, and when we do that, then we fight the greatest plague of all, which is the plague of sin and death. Coronavirus is a minor plague compared to the plague that the enemy's been unleashing on us for since the Garden of Eden. We bring atonement against that plague. That plague can't touch us any longer. We are free from the idea of that, that plague coming upon us. We have to be this holy community, a set-apart community, a, a community of priests. How did they do it? Look at verse 21. The Levites purified themselves from sin and washed their clothes. How do you make yourself one of these people 
that is a priest bringing atonement for others? Well, purify yourself from sin. Shake the sin out of your life. Sin separates you from God. You know what the definition of sin is? It's anything that separates you from God. Is this song sin? I don't know. Does it make you closer or further away from God? Is this this activity I'm doing sin? I don't know. Does it bring you closer or further away from God? It's real simple to figure out, isn't it? Is it bringing you closer to Jesus or further away from Jesus? Because if you keep going in the direction of further away from Jesus, you're going to, don't be surprised when you end up far away from him. You know, you know if, you, if Bealton is this way on the road out front and that's not Bealton, don't be shocked if you go that way, you don't end up in Bealton. You'll end up further away from it. I don't know why we live our life thinking we can still sin and get closer to God. Sin separates you from God. Yes, but doesn't get Jesus, the blood of Jesus cover all my sin? Yes, it does, but if you keep choosing to do it, to think it, to engage in things that draw you further from God, you're not going to get any closer to God. And how can we advance if we don't become people who move closer to God? During this season, whenever we decide we can open back up as a church or whatever God calls us to do, one thing we need to be is people who have purified ourselves from sin. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brothers, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You know, the sacrifice God calls for is not bulls and oxen. Sacrifice he calls for is all of us. All you are. And it's the exact same sacrifice he gave for you. All he was. He gave it for you so that you could give it all for him. He calls us to give it all, to give every bit of it, to give it to God. And the interesting thing is when we give it all to him, he gives us all of it back, just like he did with the Levites. He gives it all right back to us. If you continue reading in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us about the gifts that in verse 2 and following tells us about how we're gifts to one another, working among one another, encouraging and building, and it's a beautiful picture of the fellowship of giving, the fellowship of people who are priests giving to one another. And if you want to advance as a church, this is what we must be to do that. We have to be set apart to serve. Last little section there, and this one convicts me a little bit. When the priests were 50 years old, they withdrew from the duty of service, and they served no more, but their job was to keep guard and to watch the boundaries and to make sure the boundaries weren't crossed. And I feel like that's a call in my life. And if you're younger in this church, I speak to you here. I do feel like my call as I become a more elder saint and my beard gets wider and wider and I become older, I feel like my job is to help build the boundaries to where you're free as younger saints to minister in God's Word and to minister in God's power. I would love for my role here to not be front line. I'd love to not be doing all the work and service and sermons and all the work here. I mean, somebody asked me one time, oh, you preach all the time here. Yes, I do, but I don't have that many other people who are saying I want to do this. And I would love to have some people that I could guide into the place of doing the service of God, build the boundary around them, because that's what it says that those over 50 years old are supposed to do. In a nutshell, what I'm saying is the next generation of this church is very important, whether you're a teen or whether you're in your 20s or whatever age you are or whether you're a child. The next generation is very important, and my job now is to help invest in that next generation. Please let me invest in you. If you feel that call, please allow me to invest in you and see you grow, because that's what I'm called to do. I'm 50, I'm 51 now, so I'm a year past this. I'm, I'm an old guy now. Somebody can say amen to that if you want. I'm old. And don't even get an amen when I say I'm an old geezer anymore. The next part, chapter 9. Be a part of a temporal community. Temporal is a word that means existing in time. In other words, if you're going to be a church, know your time. Know what time it is. No, don't look at the clock and say, Pastor, you're running a little late on this sermon. That's not what I mean. I mean, you dwell in time, this time. Do you know, that, you know right now this moment is all you have and the moment you think about it, it's already gone? You, you live in this time. And you live in a certain season. You live in a season where coronavirus will probably be the, this pandemic will probably be the defining moment of the next three or four decades. It, it, this season, this time, this year is probably the defining moment of this whole hundred year, this whole century. It's probably what will define what this world does for the next 80 years. Know that time. Know that you live in that time. Because you live in a diff different time than any other time. And knowing your time is important. And time has a rhythm. And if you're going to advance into the next time, you're going to have to understand the rhythm of this time. You're going to have to understand what God is doing now 
so that you can take a step into what God is about to do. We use our time, talent, and treasure. We use those three things to invest in the promise. And if we don't get the times right now, if we don't get the season we're in now, we'll never even recognize the next season when it comes. And I fear that's what we're doing in the middle of this pandemic. I fear a lot of Christians aren't understanding. They think this is a time to go off and go to the beach and do whatever they want and not come to the church of, of, of God, not come to the place where they can connect with God. This last six months was not a time for you to go do whatever you want and spend all your money. This last six months was a time for you to get closer to Jesus for whatever's coming in the next six months. And I've been saying this for the last six months. Know that time or you'll miss the next six months. Didn't Jesus say that about the young virgins who didn't bother to put oil in their lamp? You know what their problem was? They didn't know the time of the bridegroom was here. They didn't know it was time. They didn't know the time of Jesus was near at hand. They didn't see that time had come. We must know the time if we're going to live in the promise. Sunday is a rhythm. I cannot make it without Sunday morning. And I don't think you all are either. I think if you're not... I mean, there's plenty of space together here. Some people, well, I can't come back yet. Yeah, if you have a real medical problem, that's okay. I get that, okay? If, you, if you've got heart problems, you, I mean, really, you should stay away. But for the vast majority of you, you're just making excuses now. There are two rows completely empty here. There is 15 feet between this person and that row over there, and the same over here. There's one person in this whole section right now. Uh, there's one person in that section. That section pretty full, all one big happy thing. And the patio's got plenty of space out there. I, I don't know how you're making it without this rhythm. And I don't say this because I need you here so I can count you. Or I, just, I say this because I love you. And without the rhythm of being in church on Sunday morning, without that, I, I think I would drift away quickly. I've missed probably three Sundays in my life. Um, one of them I had surgery, and then I had the flu and missed two Sundays. Bad flu one time, missed two Sundays. I don't ever remember missing any other Sundays in the last 25 years of my life. And it isn't because I'm better than you. It's because I need Sunday. I need the people of God. I need the worship of God, and I need to do it with other people. And notice in verse 10 of this next section of, of Passover, Passover was a rhythm. That's why it's a section on Passover. Passover, remember, was when the death angel passed over the people of Israel because they knew the time and they did the things that God told them to do in that time, which led them to the next time. They understood the rhythm of Passover, and that's the point of the rhythm. It was, as verse 2 says, an appointed time, that as verse 4 says, they should keep the Passover. But there were some unclean people around. There were some people who had touched a dead body, and they had become unclean. They weren't good enough to be a part of Passover. And so Moses says, let me go ask God what to do about these people. Let me go ask them. God says to them that the unclean should still keep the Passover. They just do it the next month. But it's still important. They just need to, in other words, don't sit and say, well, I'm, I'm not good enough to come to church. The Lord says come church anyhow. The Lord says go ahead and set yourself right, and the first right thing you're going to do is coming to church. I've had people come to this church, people say, you know, they're a rotten sinner. I'm like, yeah, they've done something really good. They came to church. That's a right thing. They're moving in the right direction. They've done the right thing. Just because you've got problems don't mean you come to church. You should still keep the Passover, it says. Verse 13, if anybody, get this one, is clean and not on a journey, fails to keep the Passover, that person should be cut off from the people. That seems harsh, doesn't it? But think about it. Exodus chapter 12, where it talks about Passover, the destroying angel came and literally destroyed them if they didn't know the times. I think the word here is that if we don't get the rhythm of God, the time that we're living in, the Sunday morning rhythm, the rhythm of Bible study, the rhythm of being, and that's what, what's off right now is those rhythms. If we don't get that, we will be cut off from the people. Some of you, if you're watching this distantly right now, you feel cut off from the people of this church. And you're thinking, well, this church hasn't reached out to me. We have. No, we just can't reach out to you five times a week. This church isn't reaching out and meeting my needs. Well, we don't even know your needs at this point. You haven't been here in six months. You're getting cut off from your people. And we learn in 2 Corinthians the first trick of the enemy is to cut you off from the people of God, to draw the sheep off from the fold so they can kill the sheep. And that's what's happening. You're being drawn off. You must find a way to reconnect with the fellowship of God. You must. And whether if you're stuck with only doing this online, you need to start commenting online. You need to watch this on Sunday morning and comment on this and be a part of the fellowship. And if you can be here, somebody said, what about kids? We're not running kids ministry yet. 
it's cool, okay? If your kid makes noise, so kid over little Ella sitting over there coloring right now, and, and I don't care if Ella makes a little noise. It doesn't bother me. I can out preach Ella. It doesn't. We're a family here, okay? And, and your family's important to us. And we'll start kids' ministry as soon as it's safe. But for right now, they can play on the playground. They can run around here. Stop making excuses because you're being cut off from the people of God. And I'm afraid what's going to happen to you when you're cut off. The enemy doesn't call out. The wolf doesn't call out a sheep from the fold so he can play with patty cake with the sheep. He cuts it off from the fold so he can kill the sheep. And, and you're being cut off. Make no mistake about it. If you're cut off from the people of God, it's only another step back to the old lifestyle you were in. If a stranger sojourns among you, then they must take place in this too. So visitors walk in the door. We've got to create space for them. There has to be a rhythm. And this rhythm defines the community. It defines who you are in the community. And it defines our purpose together as a church. So when you're not here, we don't really, we can't define who we are as well. If you're still part of this church and you're not here, we have trouble defining who we are without you. We have trouble with a purpose without you. The gifts can't operate the way they're supposed to without you. Simple truth is we need each other. Next part, if you'll give me another minute to finish this so we can get on to the stuff next week. Um, the cloud covering comes upon the tabern tabernacle. Remember we saw this back in Leviticus. There was a cloud that covered the tabernacle and a fire by day. And that fire always came and it dwelled, it said, by day it dwelled there. And when it lifted, the people followed the fire or the cloud, and they knew it was time to go. By the way, they haven't went anywhere yet, so this is a pretty promising statement. This is like, hey, when you hear the sound, go. When you hear the car start, we're getting ready to leave. When you hear the bell ring, class is over. This is one of those things that says it's about ready to happen. But what happens is the cloud, the presence, the, the very part of God, the very movement of God. Remember, God's dwelled at Sinai. Now it says God's going with them. He's coming out on them. He's moving with them. And as he moves out with them, as he comes forward and moves out with them, they're to follow that presence. Here's what we have to follow. I've had people ask me, what, do you, what does church do in the middle of this pandemic? I don't know. We used to have wonderful outreach teams that face painted kids. And I see other churches doing outreach events where they're face painting kids, but I ain't doing it. Okay, I'm not going to put any of you all next to 100 kids three, feet, three inches from their face for four hours at a time in the middle of a pandemic. I love you too much for that, and I love our community too much for that. It's not happening. Pastor, you're just afraid of coronavirus. No, I'm not, I love you, and I'm not... I mean, hey, we can go stand in the middle of the road and wait on a truck to come and talk about fear if you want to. Good sense says get out of the road. There is such a thing as good sense. So what do we do as a church then? If we don't have our outreach teams that we'd become really good at, schools invited us in. But I mean, we, were, we, we had more invitations than we could accept to go do outreach all over the place in this community, and we don't have that anymore. The hardware store we worked with is now closed. The, uh, and that was good timing, I guess. She, she knew when to close right before the pandemic. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, a lot of what we've worked with and done, it isn't there. What do we do next? Well, I don't know, but here's what I do know. If your eyes are on the presence of God... He'll show you. And I'm waiting on some of you LCCers to say God's leading us here. How do we know where God is? Well, I don't see a pillar of fire and a flame, do you? But you know what I do see? I see the activity of God at work in our community. I see Jesus healing lepers. I see Jesus hanging out with drug addicts. I see Jesus running through this community, and I ride through this community, and I see the places where I see Jesus at work. You know, it's not rocket science. Just go find what Jesus is doing and go do it with it. That's the pillar of fire for us is the activity of God. What is Jesus doing? And I think we have to ask ourselves, do you really think for the last six months Jesus has done nothing? Do you think he's sitting up in heaven, hiding in his basin with a mask over his face, afraid to move out? He's doing something. What is it? Hey, I'm 51 years old. My job is to guard the boundaries now. We just said that, didn't we? You want to know what Jesus is doing? 20 years ago, I planted this church. I was 30. I could have told you exactly where we were supposed to go. You know what? It ain't my job anymore. It's your job. You're a part of this church. You go find where Jesus is working, and I'll help you guard the boundaries, and I'll help you build it theologically, and I'll help you stay in the boundaries that God blesses. But I think that's time that every LCC or say, this is the activity of God, and I've got to go do it. I'm moving out, and I'm moving forward, and I'm going to do it. And it says they would not move if God didn't move, and if God did move, they did move. And that's a wonderful rule for your life. If God's moving, I'm going with him. If he ain't moving, I'm going to sit right here and not move. I'm going to do what God does. I'm going to follow what he does. 
Then finally in chapter 10, and we'll wrap up chapter 10, finally in chapter 10, they're to make two silver trumpets. Um, Richard, our trumpet player, I told him he should have said he brought his trumpet. I think he should blow a trumpet sound or something here. And uh, I appreciate we have a trumpet on Sunday morning because it's a biblical instrument. And you know what a trumpet did? A trumpet signaled a new time, a new season, a new place. A trumpet tells us that worship comes first. When the trumpet appeared, they gathered themselves, it says in verse 3. They knew that it was time together, and they knew that something was changing. Whenever they heard that trumpet sound, something new was going to be happening. The call of God was on them. There was something. God was about to direct their movement. The enemy had appeared, and God would direct them. And it says as the one blast would go, the northern groups would move forward, and the next blast would bring the southern troops forward. And it was the way they called their troops to advance and move forward. It's a movement of advancement. Every time God wants to do something new among us, he, he does it with new worship. If he's going to take you to a new level, new worship is the first place he's going to take you. He's going to take you to a new level or place of worship. The trumpet will sound in your life. I don't know if you literally hear a trumpet. If Richard's here, you will. But otherwise, what you're going to do is you're going to realize God's calling me to a new place of worship. He calls you to that new place. Worship means what we focus on, what we give worth to. And it may not just be, I mean, today we learned it isn't all about music and a band. It's not. Worship is what I focus on. He will call me to a more intense focus on him if he's getting ready to call me to a more intense activity or a place where I, a new land, a new place of blessing. And look at Matthew 24, verse 31. He will send his archangels and with loud trumpets will call and gather all of his light together from the four winds. A trumpet will signal that a new time has come. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling an eye. When? At the last trumpet. When that trumpet sounds, everything changes. Though what was, what was is no more, and now we're moving into the new land. When the trumpet sounds, there is a new land to move into. For, it says in 1 Corinthians, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The trumpet means things are changing. Have you heard the trumpet in coronavirus? Have you realized there's a trumpet blowing in the middle of this pandemic? Have you heard that trumpet saying it ain't ever going to be the same? It ain't. People, when's church going to go back to the way it was? And I said, it's never going to, thank God. Thank God he's called us to another season. When is my life going to go back like it was? It never is. Thank God he's calling you to a new land. You're not camped at Sinai forever. He's called you to a new land. Revelation chapter 8 through 9, seven trumpets blow, and every time they blow, the world fundamentally changes. You're hearing a trumpet right now. We're changing, and it's a good change. He's calling us to get out from under Sinai and advance. Maybe Israel didn't want to advance. We'll see that in a few chapters. Because the truth is there's an enemy over there. There's uncertainty over there. You know what keeps us from advancing more than anything else? You know what stuck them at Sinai more than anything else? Their own self. They didn't really want to advance, I don't think, and you'll see that in chapter 11 when we turn the page to chapter 11. And finally, in chapter 10, and we'll unpack this a little bit next week, they move forward. Finally, the trumpet sounds. Finally, they move forward. Finally, it's time to move forward, and they move forward with these words in verse 35. Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And then it rested, and he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand and thousands of Israel. Return, O Lord. Arise, O Lord. Scatter your enemies. Give us peace. Give us this blessing, but take us to a new level. I wonder how many of y'all want to go to a new level. I wonder how many of y'all want to be in a new level. How many of y'all want to walk out of this level? You know, I'm done with this level. When you're playing a video game and you're done with this level, you ever went back and played it again? It ain't as much fun next time around. You've already done this level. I don't want to sit in the same. You could play the same level 10 times over and you'd get real good at that level, but what good is it? You go to the next level. You got to go to the next place. This is the next level, and I wonder how many of y'all want to go with us. How many of y'all want to go to the next level? How many of y'all want to move out? We've unpacked over the last two weeks how to do that. Would you take a moment? I'm going to sing this song because it's one of my favorites, and it's about going to the next level. I want, I'm going to sing this song, and as I do, we're going to go ahead and close. I pray this blessing upon you, and I pray that God's face does shine upon you. And we're just going to close as this song ends because I want you to continue in prayer and say, Lord, I really want the next level. I'm done with this level. I'm done with being in this level. Let's see, if you know this song, 
If you don't, just, just pray with me. Just dedicate yourself to the next level, to what he's called you to be. This is a song by Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby was blind. Um, wrote the best worship songs that were ever written. Uh, worshiped God no matter what. Um, and understood exactly what it was to always be at another level. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befalls me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of His.